Well, thank you very much, Bob, and it's a huge pleasure uh, to be here. Um, I, I, and thank you for the invitation. I th think the very fact that, uh, well, the organisers have asked me as a representative of government to stand here, and also the fact that we're all gathered here in London, uh, tells us something about the UK's commitment to the issue of illegal wildlife trade. Um, it is very substantial. I see it in, in, in ministers who I interact with almost on a daily basis. Um, they are really passionate about this and want to genuinely do something about it. Um, I also had a, had a quick look at the programme for today. Um, I think it's a tremendously imaginative um, set of activities you have. Um, and one of the things that I would probably want to challenge you with, and I'll come back to this at the end, is are we sufficiently joined up on the evidence that we produce about illegal wildlife trade to have the impact that we would wish to see? Um, and in a sense, and I'll come back to this with a question right at the end, is there an evidence failure in, in this area? Um, I, I think there probably is, and there's, that's something that we need to um, try to address. I'll also say um, I am probably about the least qualified person in this room to give this talk. Um, and that's, that's partly because actually I spend my, very little of my time on this subject, whereas uh, pretty much all of you spend most of your time um, dedicated to the subject. Uh, so I feel um, slightly out of my depth. So what I'm going to try to do is um, give you an, a, a sense of what it is to provide science advice into policy, at least through my perspective. And that perspective, of course, is one of a scientific advisor in a major advanced economy with uh, a very well-structured governance system. Uh, I fully appreciate that many of you are working your trade within very different kinds of circumstances. However, I hope that some of the experiences I've had can uh, try to give you a context within which uh, to provide some sort of structure around what is going on in terms of science advice. Um, I'm going to start uh, a bit theoretical and then get into where I think uh, some of these things might have an impact on uh, the illegal wildlife trade issue. So um, this is roughly the structure. I'm going to provide um, some guidance concerning uh, scientific advice. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the functions of science and policy, types of evidence, and then evidence in wildlife, inter illegal wildlife trade policy, and perhaps give something, or not perhaps, I'll try and give some idea of uh, the kind of frameworks that we might want to look at with respect to evidence. But first of all, I'd like to just give you, uh, again, this is the sort of theoretical bit, um, a, a context for science advice in, in policy. Um, and when I talk about science, uh, and I'm not sure if this, you know, this works here, when I talk about science, what I'm talking about this is this whole string from data all the way through to evidence here. Um, it's the process that's really important. Um, it's not, uh, it's, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing sort of special about this other than that we want to make sure that when we produce evidence at, 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 as an output, that it's actually underpinned by a very robust and strong process. And part of my job is to make sure that process is robust and strong. However, the interaction between uh, what goes on down here and the policy sphere really works, in my view, in three modes. Um, one is what I call a linear mode or a linear model, um, which is about science delivering information to policy. Uh, policy takes it away and turns it into something hopefully useful. Um, the IPCC and the Montreal Protocol are both really, quite good, really good examples of that. And the IPCC, of course, produced uh, its report uh, yesterday, uh, which was uh, effectively berating uh, the policy um, community for not doing enough on climate change, quite rightly so, in my view. Um, and, and there's a little bit of hitting policy with a stick here sometimes, and that is needed on occasions, there's no doubt about it, and holding policy to account 
There is then another mode, which is co-design, or I call it co-design, where there's um, a strong interaction between science and policy. Um, and uh, in, in my area, at least, waste and resources and food uh, sit within, those, those, within this sort of category. And I suspect a lot of the illegal wildlife trade uh, science policy interaction or evidence policy interaction uh, works in that mode where you're working with policymakers uh, trying to design interventions uh, which they, you're then trying out and seeing if they work and that sort of thing. And then there's a, 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 an ultimate uh, position which is uh, an integrated um, mode of operation where essentially the science and the evidence is the policy. Um, and in my area, at least, uh, the areas where, where that works best is in fishery science, because fundamentally that defines the policy, and also in d disease control issues. Uh, and there are other areas um, of environmental management uh, where that sort of interaction is extremely so strong. So science equals policy, and policy equals science. And in a sense, we want to try to progress from this kind of model of working down to this one. Uh, and the clo closer we can get to this, the better. So that's the kind of general direction of travel we want to go in. But I think there are three questions uh, we as um, scientists or evidence gatherers uh, can ask. Uh, uh, and, and what I want to do is go through um, each, of these, each of these questions and give you a little bit of an insight into at least how I would answer these questions. So what are the key attributes needed of scientific advice? Well, I think scientific advice needs to be short, concise, brief. Um, it needs to be honest. Um, and it needs to be honest, particularly around the uncertainties that there are. Um, it needs to be pitched to the audience. Um, so policymakers are different from politicians, definitely. Think differently, they act differently. And you need to understand their problem. So try to see the problem through their eyes. It also needs to be um, outcome orientated as much as possible. So that's about providing solutions rather than problems. I think science has often been very good, particularly, let's say, in areas like climate change, of saying, you have a problem, here it is, you sort it out, rather than saying, we have a problem, we need to find solutions together on this. It needs to be practical, so let's try to avoid theory if we possibly can. It needs to be, uh, as much as we can, non-political. And I think in the illegal wildlife trade area, and actually in many other areas, this is a minefield, because scientists can become advocates. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to become an advocate for a particular cause, especially in something like illegal wildlife trade. Um, but actually, if you want to be listened to, by those people who probably most need your advice, sometimes advocacy is not a good idea. It needs to be options-based, I think, uh, and it needs to be authoritative, respected, and robust. So if we move on to how should scientists themselves behave in these circumstances, well, I think we need to be trusted. We need to em be empathetic as much as possible, polite, friendly, all those sorts of things that make one feel uh, one is, uh, one is um, or we, uh, help to make one welcome. Need to be independent. Uh, there needs to be integrity in what we say, honesty, objectivity, impartiality. Um, we need to be authoritative uh, and respected. We need to be wise. Um, it helps to have some gray hair when you're walking into the, the office of a minister uh, because you look as if you're wiser as a result of that. At least you've got some age on you and maybe some experience. Um, uh, I'm not suggesting that those without grey hair are not wise, but uh, nevertheless, it does help on occasions. Um, you need a breadth of interest, at least in my kind of role. Um, uh, you know, here I'm speaking on illegal wildlife trade. Uh, I could be speaking on fisheries. I could be speaking on plastics. I could be speaking on a whole load of things. I find that fascinating. Not everybody does. But the breadth of interest brings a capacity to see um, things through a different uh, set of lenses as well. Uh, you need political intelligence as well. Um, and, and that is about confidence with deference. Um, you need to be thick-skinned um, and uh, able to listen 
as much as to talk. Um, there's certain, certainly a requirement for organizational intelligence because often you're working with very large structured organizations uh, some can be large organizations that are pretty unstructured and disorganized as well. So uh, you need that organizational intelligence. And I think you also need to be an opportunist and be patient. So what sort of outcomes and expectations would we expect? Well, I think uh, we need to keep things in perspective. Uh, we probably shouldn't expect too much in the short term. Uh, we should also keep in mind that science is usually only one dimension of, uh, of the problems that are being uh, dealt with. Uh, and there, there can be social dimensions and political dimensions and economic dimensions as well. Um, many of the people that you speak to as a science advisor will be skeptical, and they'll be skeptical because they've maybe come across science in the past and it hasn't done them any favors. So they've maybe come across people who have been strong advocates, who have pushed them in particular directions, which eventually hasn't actually worked out. And I come across that in the civil service in the UK all the time. Um, so there are people who are skeptical. Um, the other thing is don't always expect support from your colleagues. Um, uh, sometimes colleagues have different points of view. Uh, sometimes when you're working in highly controversial areas, they simply just don't want to get involved. Um, but do expect slow incremental pro progress, uh, and hopefully that will be in the right, right direction. And also that sometimes there will be perverse outcomes. So let's have a look at functions of science in policy. Um, I see science having three fundamental functions. Uh, the first and most important one, which often is not uh, really played out strongly enough, even in a government like in the UK, is, oh, there we go. Uh, oh, I'm missing a slide there, sorry about that. Um, is, to, is to lead policy development. Um, and that's about horizon scanning, and it's about synthesis, uh, synthesis is really important, being able to take all the evidence that exists and synthesize it down to, 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 to make it relevant to a particular subject. It's about adaptive designs to policy as well, and I'll come back to that in a minute, because uh, if we want to get to the integrated model of policy making uh, and science, science and policy making, then we have to get to um, adaptive designs of policy making where the science is really doing the experiment through the policy and trying to find out what works. Uh, secondly, I think there's, there's support for policy implementation. So that's about analysis and it's about evaluation of how policies are working. And then as I uh, referred to before, I think there's assurance of the information hierarchy. So there's assurance that data is being gathered in a robust way, that it's being transferred into information robustly, then into knowledge, and then into evidence. And that hierarchy is really important. There are a lot of people around who think data equals evidence, and it doesn't. Um, data is a very different thing from evidence, and it has to go through a translational, uh, translational process, which requires a, a robustness of methodology. Let's come to the types of evidence now. So, um, I think that uh, I'm, a well, I'm a natural scientist, uh, and I tend to think as a natural scientist, but there are lots and lots of different ways of thinking about problems. And uh, in terms of uh, the kinds of uh, 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 sort of skills uh, and, uh, and evidence that is brought to bear on something like illegal wildlife trade, we, we need to use the whole range, the whole gamut, of the evidence professions, the analytical professions. Um, I've changed the size of some of these to try to reflect what I think might be most important in the illegal wildlife trade uh, sphere. But certainly all of these are important in most of policy making to different extents. So uh, my suspicion is that economics and social science are probably uh, uh, very important. 
Uh, that natural science plays a role mainly because we're dealing with wildlife and wildlife populations, wildlife population dynamics, those sorts of things. Um, and there will be a drawing on, uh, on, on a, a range of different um, expertise here with uh, a lot of independent experts, a lot of national and uh, international uh, science experts and intergovernmental groups because this is a transboundary uh, issue. I've actually... Oops. Yeah, I'll, I'll manage. Uh, um, I, I, I've actually um, played down government specialists here, but actually I think that government specialists should be able to play a much bigger role. And I'm going to try and explain why that is. Um, so let me have a look at evidence in international, uh, sorry, uh, um, illegal wildlife trade uh, policy. So um, a lot of this will be familiar to you, more familiar to you than it is to me. Uh, there's a number of initiatives producing uh, evidence. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, UN uh, uh, initiative uh, on um, uh, drugs and crime has produced uh, a report that, uh, on wildlife crime. Uh, the, there's the IWC Challenge Fund. Uh, there's the issue about delivery of value for money as well. Now, this is something that um, uh, I have some <coughs> challenge with in governments, uh, particularly in developed country governments uh, like the UK, where uh, the development of a value for money model is right at the center of decision making. Um, however, value for money is a very utilitarian view of the world, and I think there are other philosophical, moral um, uh, balances to be, to be struck here about just what is the right thing to do. And I see this in ministers uh, whenever I interact with them on this. Uh, there is the, the dilemma between how much money can be spent that's going to give us value back against what they, in their gut, really feel ought to be done. And with illegal wildlife trade, I think the balance is, to, is towards what we really just need to get on and do. Um, and then there's, there's uh, some interesting things going on with respect to innovative approaches, uh, which is about innovative finance and things like that. And there's uh, something called the Rhino Impact Bond, which I had not really heard of before, but sounds um, uh, very uh, 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 imaginative and uh, hopefully will work. And it's, it's, it's interesting because it plays into the whole issue of green finance. Um, which, which is becoming a major issue in how we manage the environment generally. So maybe there's something for illegal wildlife trade uh, in the general move uh, towards green finance. So let's have a look maybe at what sort of evidence frameworks we might want to sort of consider here. Well, first of all, as a scientist, I always like to start with a question or with questions. And those questions can be very high level. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's what and how much is traded. Um, I think uh, we heard earlier on that perhaps um, about $23 billion worth of illegal wildlife trade is going on. Um, uh, you know, it's how do we assess that? Uh, how accurate is it? Um, where is it happening? Um, who is involved? Uh, and uh, how should we respond to these sorts of, sorts of things? Now, I know that those are things which uh, many of you are, in fact, probably all of you to some extent, are trying to deal with in your own ways. Um, and those responses can be um, uh, challenged by a number of uh, issues. We're dealing with a, a major transboundary problem, so there's um, different uh, legislative uh, structures that we need to deal with. Uh, we're dealing with corruption, we're dealing with organized crime, and we're dealing with a hidden process. Uh, by definition, this is, this is hidden. And the parallels with this, uh, in my world at least, come with things like uh, modern slavery. Um, and uh, I, I, I just like to sort of take a short diversion into modern slavery and how we in the UK are seeing modern slavery because I think that there aren't just parallels, I think there's probably significant crossovers because I think we're dealing with similar types 
of organized, uh, cert certainly similar types of behavior, and in some cases, maybe uh, the same um, individuals. So in terms of sort of modern slavery, um, uh, the kind of responses that uh, we are uh, trying to develop to modern slavery um, about, are around things like multiple systems estimation, um, establishing an under, underlying t uh, typology for, for, the, for the, the problem. Uh, there's big data <laughs> approaches, um, and then there's uh, economic estimates. And I'm, I'm sure that many of these things are being done in the illegal wildlife trade area, but um, uh, I, I, I suspect not as strategically as in things like, uh, like modern slavery. Um, and the typology that, uh, for modern slavery is sitting here about labor exploitation, it's domestic servitude, uh, sexual exploitation, uh, and criminal exploitation. Um, what I haven't seen for illegal wildlife trade is this kind of strategic structure uh, for the evidence base that, uh, that everybody is trying to, to, to work on. Now, it may exist, and I'm just, I just need educated, uh, but I, I think that uh, working alongside this kind of structure and probably creating something for illegal wildlife trade that looks a bit like this could not just help illegal wildlife trade uh, uh, evidence investigation, uh, but also could help uh, modern slavery probably drugs trade as well, because they're all part of the same um, hidden, hidden process. Um, I'll just go back in a minute. Um, I, I'm going, I want to now just have a quick look at uh, demand reduction. So I think demand reduction from uh, the point of view of certainly DEFRA UK government um, is the thing is, 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 is demand is what drives international wildlife trade, and therefore, from a UK government point of view, it's, it's the area that we probably ought to focus in on most. Um, that's not to say that there shouldn't be a focus um, elsewhere, um, but we probably can't come up with a sustainable solution without um, reducing demand. And at the moment, we're only spending about 6% of global funding on the illegal wildlife trade um, in uh, reduction interventions. Um, at least that was until 2016. I, I suspect it hasn't changed uh, very much since then. Um, perhaps um, we need a structure to the evidence that uh, supports uh, demand reduction, um, which is about before, during, and after. And um, I mentioned earlier on uh, that the idea is around trying to get integration of science and evidence with policy. And that's about trying to develop an adaptive management process, um, which is about making sure that the designs are well founded in evidence beforehand, that during implementation of a policy, evidence is gathered uh, and, and there's amendments made along the way. Um, after, although it's very rarely does a policy just come to an end and then you evaluate it, you're doing a continuous process of evaluation. Um, but you're measuring success against baselines that have already been um, uh, put in place. Um, is there evidence of actual change going on? Um, and uh, how do we share the evidence? And then feeding back again to redesigning policy in such a way that um, uh, it becomes more effective. And this is a continuous cycle, a continuous process, um, which uh, actually, for those of you who are scientists, will understand it's no different from the experimental approach. Uh, and from my point of view, um, I would love to see science driving policy through uh, an evidence base to begin with, and then a co-design process, um, and then uh, a re-evaluation process afterwards. Uh, and I think that with Ill illegal wildlife trade, this is probably about the most effective way forward, uh, because the uncertainties that you have uh, before in the planning phase are so huge. Uh, but in that sense, it's not really very different from many of the, um, the kind of policies that we need to deal with, let's say, in the environment uh, generally, because there's a, an immense amount of uh, uncertainty uh, in almost all those areas. Um, there's, there's other things going on in this framework, and I'm not going to go through these in detail. But I know there is, there is an immense amount of effort going on, and certainly uh, I, I know that will be talked about 
um, uh, 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 through the day. And uh, in the UK, we've got the, the ivory bill is uh, beginning to, uh, is going through, um, and there's a consultation process around that, which is actually probably shifting people's, uh, the, the general public's view of, uh, of the issue of, inter, uh, of illegal wildlife trade, uh, and in a very good way, it's, it's raising its profile uh, and putting uh, legislation in place to control uh, trade. So just to finish and conclude, um, so I don't need to say to, to this audience that illegal wildlife trade presents a significant uh, evidence challenge. There's a lot of hidden processes going on. Uh, but nevertheless, I think we've got methodologies to be able to um, uh, meet that challenge. And some of those methodologies are about being more strategic about how we organize ourselves. And that's where I think government comes in and government leadership comes in. Um, I'm a great uh, believer in adaptive management uh, as a methodology to find out what works. Um, and again, is there evidence of, uh, is, 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 is there evidence failure in uh, illegal wildlife trade? I, I actually think we do have an evidence failure. Um, I think that we all admit that we're really struggling to provide the evidence that we need to move forward. Um, and can we learn from other hidden crime approaches as well? Uh, in that sense, I think modern slavery is a very good example to, to work with. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. That was fantastic, Ian. Thank you very much. We've got uh, a little bit of time for questions. So can I open out to the... Is there a question at the front? Is there... No, I think just... The microphone here. There we go. Yeah, hi. Um, this is working or not. In your slide on types of evidence, you talked a lot about um, different types of expertise and different types of science. I wonder what you think, think about local knowledge, traditional knowledge, and uh, local expertise. I know that um, ITBES, for example, has been struggling with how to yeah. integrate Western science and traditional knowledge, and so I'd just be interested in your thoughts on that, particularly relevant to this debate, given yep. it's local people who have so much knowledge about what's happening in their territories on illegal wildlife trade. Uh, absolutely. I think local knowledge is really, really important, and, and uh, thank you for that. It should go into that slide. Um, I'm, I suppose I'm guilty of uh, taking the kind of developed world view of where our evidence and knowledge comes from. Although, having come from a fisheries background, actually, the local knowledge of fishermen, it, 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 you know, in, my, in the science that I've done in the, in the past, one of the biggest challenges has been to find ways in which you can properly integrate local knowledge in a robust way in using the evidence hierarchy, you know, because the local knowledge is actually the data it's at the left hand end of the spectrum. One of the problems that we have with local knowledge is that we sometimes see it as the evidence and actually it's part of the data. If we start seeing it as part of the data and structure the acquisition of the local knowledge around data, it then has to go through the, 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 the it's not a filtering process as much as a, a development process that comes to the evidence at the end of the day, we'll all be much better off. But I completely agree with you. Local knowledge is really important. Hi there. So in the beginning of your talk, you'd said um, how scientists can sometimes stray into the world of advocacy and how that's not always useful. Um, but also at the beginning of your talk, you talked positively about the IPCC report and talked positively about how scientists had been berating the policy community for insufficient policy action. So as a policy advisor, I'm interested to know um, where you think the line stands between evidence-based advocacy and scientific advice. So that's, uh, that's a, a, a very challenging question. Um, it's, and actually, it, what it comes down to is an in individual moral judgment, I think. Um, I, I, I mean, I personally, I've been in this job now for over more than six years, and, and I, I, I think I've come on a journey 
uh, an, uh, you know, a, a, a moral journey during that time from starting from a position of being, I'm the science advisor, I'm, um, uh, I'm separated from the issue, and I just want to give the science advice so that those who want to make decisions around an issue have the best advice, and I'm not going to get involved in that. And most of the time that works quite well, but there are times when uh, on some of the really big issues, and climate would be one of them, when the policy field needs a good kick, uh, and uh, because the evidence is really strong. Uh, and I would have said that we, we have a similar problem, which is actually an even bigger problem around the resource consumption, uh, of which the illegal wildlife trade is just a sub small subset, where actually I think that we're cruising in a direction uh, with our, which, is, which we're blind to. Um, and my, my position on that is to be really uh, all, uh, an advocate for doing something about that, because I think morally I have to do that. So it depends on the, depends on the, 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 the issue, it depends on the circumstances, it depends on your, who, you're, who you're speaking to. Uh, so it's, in the end, it's down to an individual judgment about when to do it and when not to do it. Uh, but sometimes advocacy, I think, I think I would say in general, you don't, as a scientist, you would not go into advocacy, uh, advocacy mode without really thinking about it hard uh, uh, beforehand. Um, <coughs> if, I, if I stand up and, and speak very loud, perhaps we don't need to wait. My name is Lorraine Elliott. I'm Professor of International Relations at the Australian National University. I was interested in your observation about parallel um, uh, sectors. You looked at modern slavery. And I wonder how, in something like illegal wildlife trade, there's a big focus on charismatic megafauna, obviously. Yeah. Big pets, elephants, rhinos, pangolin, and now charismatic. Um, but if you look at the illegal wildlife trade, we're talking about insects and we're talking about plants and we're talking about tokai geckos and we're talking about sea horses and a range of other things where the patterns of illegal trade might not be the same. Mm. I'm just wondering from your experience, how do you deal with looking for patterns when, when actually illegal wildlife trade is not just a single black box? Yeah. How do your models and how do your calling on parallels a very good question. I, I, I'm not sure I have an answer to that question. It, it, it's a multi, the, the illegal wildlife, tra wild, wildlife trade is a multi-dimensional, highly multi-dimensional problem. It's a, in a sense, it's a bigger, more complex intellectual problem to solve than modern slavery is, because at least that you know there's there's one subject there, and it's it's human trafficking. Um, here we've got the trafficking of all sorts of different. Um, uh, agents, if you like. Um, so, you know, we, we shouldn't get into this thinking this is going to be easy, but I think we should download the experience we have from other areas and try to incorporate, incorporate that into a more strategic approach, because otherwise we won't make the progress we genuinely do need to make. Great. Thank you very much. So, again, can we thank... Uh,